You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt, director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I'd like to begin today um, by calling in the spirits to gather around us. So I call out first to the ancestors. I call out those who bring all that is good and true and beautiful from our ancestral lines to us here today that we might connect with that legacy, that we might learn from those who have gone before us and not simply repeat all of the same mistakes in new and exciting and ever more technical ways. So I call out to those ancestors who have stepped forward from the land of the dead to guide the living, that we might learn, that we might grow, that we might change and transform, and that we we might bring solutions to the problems of our day that come out of the uniqueness of our genius, not out of the habits and the traditions and the old angers of the old ways. So I call out today to those ancestors who understood the warriorship of their time and were willing to do whatever it takes for that solution that will be good for the next seven generations. So I call out to these ancestors to gather around us, not just mine, but yours as well, to gather around us and hold us well, that we might learn and grow and be better humans together. So I call out to the earth that most essential and ancient ancestor. We call out to this sweet being and give thanks to her for the wonder of her dreaming that brought life as we know it in all of its many diverse forms to this planet. And we give thanks to that life that dreamt of humans on one crazy day. And those humans who dreamt of us, we, the dreams of their future. And may we remember that we are dreamers as well and that in every moment of every day we are dreaming the future for those who are coming. So I call out to the earth that we might receive your wisdom and guidance and how to manifest and form in a good way. We ask you to help us to feel grounded and connected, to know the interconnectedness of our life here and to extend out from ourselves to feel the oneness in all things and to let that oneness guide us as we make our decisions throughout the day. So we call out to the earth to come up into each one of us to give us a sense of home and belonging and connection that we might live from a place of peace in our hearts. And from that place in our hearts and our feet firmly planted on the ground with our ancestors standing around us, let us reach up through the layers of the sky all the way out into the cosmos to call out to that highest power of the universe and by whatever name you call it, call it down into yourself, into your day, into the circle of this gathering here. Call down protection, call down blessing, call down benevolence, call down the inspiration that is there for us, for us if we can simply remember to open and to receive. So we call out to those energies and ask for that assurance and guidance to come into ourselves, our lives, and our day, that we might be motivated to act from a place of guidance and blessing. So we ask the energy of the earth below and the sky above to come and meet within us, to merge within us to the exact perfect blend for us today that we might go forward in a place of balance and harmony. And from this place in the center, we call out to the power of the heart, that unique energy within the human that creates the perfect crucible for all the powers and passions and emotions of your lower self, your belly. And all of the inspirations and clarity and visions and dreams of the mind and the higher chakras. And draw these energies together in the heart where they can merge in that crucible of transformation. That you might come to know through that merging why you are here. And find in your heart the courage to go forward in this day and to do it. To bring those gifts of your uniqueness to the world. May the proceedings here today inspire you in that. May we hear what needs to be heard and may what needs to be spoken be said. And I ask for Spirit's help in all of this. 
And I give thanks to those of you that understand that is through your donations that the show is kept alive and on the air and free to those who have access to the technology necessary to listen to it. And I ask those of you who are moved by the show in any way to allow that movement of the heart to motivate your actions to donate as well. That this is a primary core understanding in shamanism, that the energies must flow and that we want to move and direct the flow of energy from the things that move our heart and to move into action from that motivation. So may our resources of time and energy and money be moved into the things in life that move our heart, the things that matter to us and give us a sense of life. And may we draw our resources of time and energy and love and attention out of those things in life that have no meaning for us. May we do this each day, step by step, choice by choice, and move our energies and resources into those things that motivate our heart. And in this way, we will change the very construct of our lives. And so with this simple idea, I ask you if you're moved by today's show to donate. You can go to whyshamanismnow.com, click on the support button, and you are welcome to donate any amount of money, large or small. All of it is um, deeply appreciated for it is those dollars that keep the show on the air. So thank you all for listening. And even if you cannot donate financially in some way, share the show with another and keep the word spreading so the show continues, the audience of the show continues to grow. And we all continue to grow as we share these practices in our own lives with others and begin to bring shamanism and shamanic ideas back into our everyday lives in a practical way. So thank you all for joining me in this day. We continue in a conversation about warriorship in our everyday lives. Uh, We spoke about facing fear and today we are going to continue this conversation and talk about to talk about doing whatever it takes. And this sounds so simple and obvious, but it is one of the things that is most um, heartbreaking actually to watch in my practice with clients and students. There's all this, this, this effort in life to get to some sort of clarity. And, and spirit is an enormous help in that through the visionary skills of the shaman basic shamanic skill set. So that piece um, doesn't become easy. I was going to say it becomes easy. I don't know if it becomes easy, but it becomes doable and practical in an ordinary part of life to gain that clarity. The next step, though, is action, is how do we take action based on that clarity and finding in our hearts that courage and that willingness to do whatever it takes. And this is something that... um, there's always an excuse. There's always some reason. One of the most powerful things I did in my young life, I was in my 20s, and I certainly did not really have a clue um, about much of anything, but um, I was trying to pay attention. And I had some really, really good mentor type people in my life, I have to admit, at that time, and I'm deeply grateful to all of them. It took three people. That's <laughs> what a train wreck I was. But anyway, At this time in my life, I had had a job for several years with a large company, and the job title was change management. I was a change manager, and it was my job to assist in a company-wide effort to change this corporation and its corporate mentality and how it did business. They were really trying to change everything. Um, And it was a huge organizational development effort, and I was a change manager. And one thing led to another in my life, in the, in the big picture of my life, and I decided to leave this corporate job without a buyout, without um, anything, actually. I just left. Um, so there was no golden parachute there. It was just me choosing to walk away from it all. And um, what was fascinating to me at this time is that in that single choice to leave this, the comfort of this corporate job, because it was at that time very comfortable, and go back to dancing, which at the time was the last place I had known passion. And I needed to find that fire again in my life. I needed to find passion and know some kind of real bliss in my life because I really didn't have it outside of 
you know, the basic sexual activity of a 20 year old, 20 something year old. So, so I needed to find it. And the last place I had remembered being in any kind of reasonable relationship with it was dancing. And so I went back to dancing. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know where else to find it. It was the best answer that I had. And so I committed everything to that as ridiculous as that choice was. I was already old for a dancer at that point in time, but I did it anyway. Now, the point of the story is not that, that, which is actually a really good example of doing whatever it takes, but that wasn't the point of my story. The point of my story was that in that action of leaving, I created more change in that company than I did in two years of being a change manager by, by taking that action and doing what it took for me to bring my life into alignment. It stirred enormous change in other people's lives in both directions. No, people I didn't even know in the company stopped by my cubicle to tell me about how they heard about what I was doing and it so inspired them that they got out that novel they'd written in college and rewrote the first three chapters and they were going to finish it. You know, I mean, this, this incredible stirring in people to reconnect with what, was pa- what brought passion in their life. This was one act. Here I'd had this job for years and this single act, I actually changed more than I had in the job. And so the important thing to understand is that action does matter deeply. It matters. It's very important in terms of your relationship with the spirit world. Because if you say one thing and do another, the bottom line is spirit's going to watch what you're doing. Because that's where the rubber's meeting the road. That's where you're affecting uh, the physical world and it matters. And so this is not to say that those of you that are mastering the art of being and not doing because you do far too much are on the wrong path. That, that's not the point. That is another truth and it, it has its place. Um, what we're talking about today is action, is how do we take action we are, when we are at that point in life. And in particular in warriorship, we're talking about the, the fact that it usually takes more than one act to bring things into right relationship, to create an entire transformation, to come into a state of well-being or whatever it is that you're wanting to create in your life. You know, people these days have the attention span for about two steps, two, maybe three steps, and then they lose interest if it's not done yet. And, and, and I mean, whenever I'm speaking to my colleagues in any of the healing arts, you know, we all just kind of like, what is with these people? Which is, of course, us too, which is, you know, you've spent decades, 20, 30, 40, 50 years taking steps that have brought you to this place that you now want fixed. And you don't have the patience for more than three steps to get out of it. I mean, do the math, people, for goodness sakes. So, so my point is that warriorship, a huge piece of the actual warriorship of living has to do with the willingness to do whatever it takes, step after step after step. Now, it doesn't have to be quite the drama of true grit or something like that, but that was certainly an example in that young girl of the willingness to do whatever it took. And there are, there are many, many examples of this in um, film. Today, many graphic visual examples, but I want to talk today about this in in the context of our own lives. And so for us to talk about this, we need to, to tap back into this awareness, which we discussed in the show Facing the Fears, is that we as contemporary people need to understand the archetype of the warrior differently than most of us do straight out of the gate here in America. Um, And one resource today that can assist you in that um, transformation of that understanding is the Toltec I Ching. It's a very, very old new way of looking at warriorship. And the wisdom and the inspiration um, of the Toltec I Ching speaks to the cultivation of the spirit warrior within. And my, you know, I, I... I'm very conscious of the fact that this nation, America, is at war on several fronts right now and that Americans are dying daily, um, as are other people 
people are dying daily because of these actions. And so I want to just take a moment here and say, why, are, why am I bothering to talk about attending to the warrior within um, when there's warriors or soldiers at least out there dying on both sides of whatever the fence is um, all over the world. And the reason for that is, is that those of us who aren't dying on the front lines have the luxury of our lives, but also the luxury of coming to understand a kind of mature warrior through that, the metaphor of the actual fighting out on the lines kind of warrior. And that if we, those of us who can, do not pay attention within to, to come to terms with the enemy within and to cultivate a kind of mature warrior within ourselves. We, na- we cannot possibly begin to stand up to meet these soldiers as they come home and do what needs to be done here, home side, state side, whatever that's called, to greet these warriors, to bring them back, to to stand up for whatever the healing is that they need after this experience and to create a path for them to follow into their own mature warriorship on the scale and um, in the way that they need to. So these two things matter. As long as we remain children, we are not going to have what it takes to show up when these people come home and to create the context for them to find their way through their healing to their own kind of mature warriorship um, from having lived, lived out this role. So there's, there's no way around it, people. And the bottom line for where we are in the Western world and certainly in America culturally is that we have to grow up. I mean, we just cannot continue to try to get everything that we need in life with the maturity of an 18-year-old. It just, I know that's what your culture promised you, but it's an empty promise. And so the, the, the fun, really, of warriorship is it's where the actions happen. It's where we get to actually begin to take the steps and grow up and start to make new choices in life that begin to create a different quality of life. And from that quality of life we're beginning to craft, we begin to see the things that we're truly dreaming of in life take shape and materialize in our life. So a spirit warrior is a person who is engaged in consciously defeating the enemy within. And part of that means not waiting for life to push you into that with a car wreck or something, but to, but to understand that as an adult, it's part of your responsibility to consciously engage in that art of that relationship with the enemy within. And that the fears that we discussed um, in the previous show arise from this enemy within. And that these fears are not something to be afraid of, but they are the signs that life gives us that allow us to track back to that enemy within and to transform that relationship. And we spoke about this in great deal in the Facing Your Fears show, which is available online now. So the spirit warrior is part feminine warrior and part masculine warrior. And in that dynamic tension, in that imagination and expression, there are two pulsing presentations of the mature warrior. And together as one human, the warrior is an expression of the creative force in all things. So the operative term here is creative force. The warrior is the action and the quality of the action. The visionary engages the dreams and visions and supplies the what. And we talked a lot about dreaming um, in the January shows. So the visionary engages the dreams and visions and supplies the what. And the warrior engages with life in a creative process to discover how to do the what. And more importantly, how to do that in a good way. What is the right use of power? This is my what? This is my thing that I want to create or do in life or transform or whatever it is. How do I do that in a good way? How do I do that in a way that is good for other living things? There's a gajillion ways to do everything. But not all of them have the same quality 
And in the quality of the doing, there can be a lot of fallout, a lot of collateral damage that we aren't really interested in creating. And so this is part of the art of warriorship is not only understanding action, but understanding right action. And in that right action, doing whatever it takes. So now remember, don't get all like, oh, warriorship, that's not about me. Because warriorship can be seen in simple actions in any day or full transformations that may happen over months or years. But in the each day, we mobilize warriorship in simply being willing to speak the truth. I had a little exchange with my partner over breakfast and he said to me, you know, I think you're making too much out of this. And I said, no, this is me trying to talk to you about this thing we discussed last time that it's you don't know I'm having a problem with it unless I bring it up. So this is me bringing up the thing I have a problem with that you never know I'm having a problem with. And he goes, oh, yeah, right. So that was my willingness to just speak the truth. Neither one of us was right. Neither one of us was wrong. It wasn't a big issue, but not just having another bite of eggs and overlooking it. It wasn't a big deal, but it was that little moment of saying, no, this is what we committed as a couple to do better communicating about and being willing to stand up for that us as a couple and the commitment we had made at a previous date. So this is a small, tiny act of warriorship, but this is where it begins. This is what you build your warriorship on is simple things like speaking the truth, setting healthy boundaries by being congruent in your words and actions, um, We mobilize warriorship when we disengage from activities that have no heart or meaning for us, that we step out of gossip, we step out of blaming, we catch ourselves whining. That was like sort of mortifying for me over the holidays. I thought, God, I'm whining about everything. We catch ourselves in these behaviors and we disengage. These are all daily acts of warriorship and it is on these actions that the larger steps of warriorship are built. And these, these are required because it is through these actions that we begin to move out of getting lost and utterly distracted in the, the minutia of life that simply doesn't matter. The distractions, the, the – I can't – you know what I'm talking about. When we begin in these, these – even these small acts of warriorship, we begin to engage that energy that starts to move us into the mythic realm, into that, that overarching realm that is always closer to what's really going on. We begin to get perspective on ourselves, on our life. The little things that don't really matter start to fall away. And we rise to a perspective on our life that we see things moving in the true patterns, the true flow of things. Warriorship is one of these archetypal patterns. It is absolutely critical for anything else to happen. Angelus Arian speaks beautifully in her work about how there is this basic level of warriorship that must occur for anything else that needs to happen to happen. And it has to do with showing up, being present, speaking the truth, honoring boundaries, these really basic things I just talked about. That opportunity exists hundreds of times in every day. And it is in the willingness to do that, to put your energy there, that your life then jumps up. It, it moves up into this other realm where we begin to get perspective on what's really going on. And it is our responsibility to do so. It is our responsibility to wield that sword of truth, of right action, to, to cut through the stagnation and the suffocation in human dynamics and the, the, the tiredness of life, to slice through, to bring others into that possibility of entering that mythic realm, entering into that realm of engaging with life where the real energies are happening. So one of the, one of the places that I saw this in relationship, again, a couple decades ago, was talking with a man at a workshop about shamanism, actually, and he was such a fascinating guy. He, he just told all these great stories about... Um, the, about his family, just just things that he and his wife and his kids had done, and they just were such great adventures. You know, instead of being these hellish family vacations, they were these really marvelous adventures. Um, 
And I, I talked with him privately one night about relationship. And he said, you know, Christina, the bottom line for us is, he and his wife, is that we are always in every conversation willing to end the relationship to save it. And that struck me so deeply at that time, that willingness to speak the truth and risk that it would end the relationship because they knew it would be the only way to save it. And these two did not have an easy situation. I think they had to live a lot of time in a couple different states because of their jobs and this and that. I don't know. It It was really beautiful. So this is what we're talking about today is the willingness to do whatever it takes So what's most interesting to me about warriorship as a contemporary shaman is the warrior's art of transformation. Each archetypal energy, which is these patterns of energy where everything's actually happening, not here in the mundane dramas of our everyday life and the patterns of our stories, but here at this archetypal level. So each archetype has an art of transformation. They have an aspect of vision. Um, They, you know, they each have these different life processes that they they manage for us in a sense or offer the code for for us so we know how to do it in a good way. And the warrior's art of transformation is transformation through love. And what? You might say we're talking about warriorships. Warriors transform through death and destruction. But this is not so from a shamanic perspective. As we, as we discussed last week in Facing Your Fear, warriorship assumes the the goodness in the other and that that goodness will allow the other to heal the wounds inflicted. So this transformation through death is really the art of the healer. And there are many examples of this in shamanism in the way shamanic people, shamanic healers conceive of healing is, is in relationship with death. In other words, the person who stands before me asking for help from a shamanic healer, right? This person who stands before me is living in the logical conclusion of their life, of their beliefs, of everything. They are living in that logical conclusion. And so what needs to be killed off? So this other voice inside of them that wants to survive can be allowed the life because the life right now is going the other direction. The person doesn't want that direction. They really want something else. So in essence, the person they are has to be killed so the person they want to be can be reborn. And so this this awareness um, that comes out of the ego death that is the initiation of the shaman in the first place, this awareness of death bringing life is the transformational art of the healer. There's an amazing um, shaman, very unique skill. I actually, as far as anyone knows, she's the only one who's ever able to do this. She had this incredible capacity for shape-shifting. And the way she did healing work is she, and, and she, she worked with people who were really close to dying because she was kind of like everybody's last resort. They, I think people thought she was a little bit crazy. But anyway, she had an incredible capacity for shape-shifting. Her capacity for shape-shifting was so um, complete that she could shape-shift other people. And so basically someone would come to her with some terminal illness and she would shape shift them into another being like a plant or an animal that wouldn't die from that illness. And so she'd shape shift them into like a lizard and that person would be a lizard long enough for the illness to die off. And then she'd shape shift them back into a person. So my point <laughs> pretty strange but pretty impressive to watch it be done so my point is that from a shamanic perspective the art of transformation through death is an art but it is the art of the healer it is not the art of the warrior that the art of the warrior the true transformational art of the mature warrior is the transformation of an enemy into an ally so now for those of you that actually watch Uh, martial arts movies think about how often this is a theme in um doubt you know daoistic based martial arts movies is that that transformation of the enemy into the ally or the actions the wrong actions 
you know, the actions not taken in right relationship with things that transform an ally into an enemy. And so this is really the art of the warrior is transformation through love. How do I, through right action, through moving power through the heart, not the ego, how do I, through right action, not only maintain right relationship with my allies, but ultimately transform my enemies into allies? So this is not only the art of the warrior, but it is also the power of the courageous heart. Each chamber of the heart has a unique power. And I am best able to uh, orchestrate the transformation through love if all four chambers of my heart are available and operational. And even for compassionate, loving people, as a contemporary person, Most of you are operating out of only one chamber of the heart, the one you are most comfortable in, and you've developed a great capacity to access your heart and your compassion through that one chamber. But even with really advanced practitioners, as we engage in the courageous heart work, we find that there are always at least one or two chambers that are not yet fully functional. And it is by the willingness to engage in whatever it takes to heal and open each of the four chambers of the heart that we get the true courageous heart. And that heart can always figure out one way or another what needs to be done and to have the willingness to do whatever it takes uh, to transform through love. And that transformation through love always is twofold. It is the person wanting the transformation and the enemy being transformed. So this isn't just crazy talk. This isn't just crazy shaman talk. That, that this is actually the fundamental beliefs that are in, uh, for example, the world work and conflict resolution of Arnie and Amy Mendel. This is excellent work they're doing all over the world. Same idea, fundamental in that. Um, and also it's at the core of uh, Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication. And these are both um, – you know, beautiful gifts to the humanity that are out there in the world. People are learning it. People are doing it. People are creating change. And they are, they are clarifying what needs to be done and doing whatever it takes um, to, um, to resolve conflict, to, to actually heal, to bring the change and the transformation to areas that are – and issues and people that are otherwise locked in conflict – Locked in violence and warfare without any belief in any possibility of any other way. And so this is what we're talking about today when we talk about the willingness to do whatever it takes and the art of transformation of the warrior is what is it going to take people for us each to get to a place where we're willing to engage in solutions that are actually solutions, Because I don't know about you all, and bless the hearts of the people that are living and dying in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, but this isn't a solution. It's a big mess for everybody involved. And so what are we going to do differently? And more importantly, how do we become people who can do something differently? So this is what I'm offering. Whether it's the Courageous Heart class that starts this weekend here in Portland. It's just two weekends. Change your life. This is what I offer in the cycle of transformation. It's four years. Okay, it's a bigger commitment, but it will change your life. It will make you a different person if you choose to engage in it. But this is the question. It's not just what are the different answers, but how do we become the people who can come up with these different answers? And who are willing to do what it takes to manifest those different actions in the world. You know, tick, 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 people. Time's a-wasting. We need to be aware, as I said in the very beginning of the show, to draw our energy, our resources, our time, our love out of those things that have no heart or meaning. Out of those things that contribute to the ultimate logical conclusion of warfare anywhere on the planet. And commit our resources of time, energy, and love 
to those things that are life affirming, to those things that allow people to live together in diversity and to harvest the great wealth and benefit of diverse communities. It's not about waiting for some president or leader to come up with the right answer. It is about us as individual people becoming the people who can come up with those answers and ultimately live those truths. And I would say we're not those people right now or we'd already be doing it. So the very fact of the not doing of it is showing us we're not those people. So let's become those people. So, sorry. So where the warrior is not engaged in its correct transformation, there is no transformation. There is just perpetual warfare. And the transformation through, so in that situation, the transformation through death is not being tended by the healer. Nor is the transformation through love being tended by the warrior. Because those who carry the vision are not tending the dream. They are tending the fantasies of their false selves. And through that, the nightmares are unfolding. And so the leaders, the people that are making the decisions that are moving nations into action. There is, they're not moving through the archetypal energies of the warrior and the healer and the transformation through death and love in a way that's supporting life. But their actions and ideas and visions are being driven by the false self. And thus they are creating fantasy and not dream. And that fantasy as it becomes manifest on the planet is a nightmare for all of us. So without the healer and without the warrior and without the visionary archetypal energy, because the visionary is caught up in these false dreamings, it leaves one archetype to save us from ourselves. And that is the teacher leader who transforms through the commitment to the process without attachment to the outcome. When was the last time you heard a contemporary leader in any country who was not attached to the outcome? So the challenge here is that our leaders around the world have not first mastered the art of true warriorship before they come into power. And thus they, the archetypal energies that move through them often move in shadow. So what needs to be mastered in terms of true warriorship for us to come into our power is first the facing our fear, which we discussed at length last week, which leads to our true capacity for discernment. And discernment to actually be able to see what's going on and to see the path of truth in that in this particular moment leads to then the willingness to do whatever it takes to the clarity about what it's going to take and the willingness then to do it. And in that, we are then able to transform the enemy into an ally, not through might, not through death, but through relationship, through connection, through communication, and ultimately through love, through compassion. So instead, what we see all around us and in ourselves is the warrior being expressed in shadow. So the shadow of the warrior, as we blame, first is manifest, of course, as we blame others for the evil that is actually within ourselves. And it's that peace that we discussed in facing our fears of warriorship being driven by the belief that the other is evil. And should be eradicated. I believe that that was why everybody got so upset with Hitler, if I'm not correct. I'm not mistaken, right? So that idea that, that somehow the evilness in another justifies the killing is misguided. It is the warrior in shadow. It is us blaming another for the shadow within ourselves. The warrior can only move in true warriorship when they believe in the good in the other and that capacity in the other's goodness to help them to heal when the wound is inflicted. And so the shadow of the warrior then, which we see all around us, has to do with 
wrong relationship with power, which is, of course, the opposite of right relationship with power. And so we see this energy in the rebel. Now, uh, I don't want you to think of this simplistically, that when rebels emerge, there is a counterbalancing energy that is also equally in shadow. In other words, rebels are forced into rebelship, right? But we need to also understand in ourselves, in our own lives, when we rebel against our meditative discipline, against our whatever we're rebelling against, against our love committed relationships, whatever we're rebelling against, against what we think we're supposed to be doing with our lives whenever we rebel, that this is misused power. The power is there, but because of some fear or dysfunction within ourselves, we are not able to run that power through true warriorship. It's moving through the shadow of the warrior through the rebel. And so this power, it ends up being misused. It's not that there isn't power. There's great power in the rebel, but it gets misused. And in that misuse, that discernment, it means it's going into patterns that are not life-affirming. So another shadow manifestation of the warrior is the disciple. And these are the people that follow blindly, that project their own inner authority onto the other, the guru, the leader, the warlord, the president, the whomever, and that they just project their own authority onto the other. And inevitably, there is a fall from grace by the leader because there can't help but be because there's this um, inappropriate projection in the first place. So in America here, we elect this fabulous man uh, two and a half years ago. And all of these Americans project their own authority onto this man. And within a year to two years, all of this, this, this public um, adoration has crumbled. Everyone's all grumpy and upset because everything they wanted didn't change in an instant because they projected their authority onto this poor man, for God's sakes, and took no authority in themselves to participate in the actions necessary, the willingness to do whatever it takes to make those changes they believed were right and true for their country. And in every speech in that first year, Obama talked about our need to take action and participate, but everybody those Many of these people sat in this place of the disciple with this president who was going to be a savior, projecting their authority onto him and not claiming their own authority in warriorship to take action and make positive change in the world. So that's the disciple energy. Another shadow manifestation of the warrior is the victim. And so the victim energy is, the, is very similar actually to the disciple because it has to do with authority. But in the victim, the authority is unclaimed. And so when we look at warriorship, we have to understand that in the victim is a warrior wanting to happen. In the victim energy is true warriorship trying to happen, but that the authority is unclaimed. And in that, in that um, negligence, in that refusal for whatever reason to pick up that authority, warriorship doesn't happen. So once again, I'm not talking about a victim out there. I'm talking about the victim in you, where you allow yourself to be victimized by whatever. Uh, I cannot tell you how many people sit before me and I ask, why are you here? You know, why are you at this shamanic healing session? And the victimization that I hear, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a victim of this, that, and the other thing in my life is basically what people are saying. Because there is this piece of authority that is utterly unclaimed. Now, understand, if someone's sitting for me for a shamanic healing session, that piece of authority is probably unclaimed because they're in a state of soul loss. And, and the warriorship that they're engaged in is coming to the shamanic healing session to get their soul parts back and integrate them. So this person is not a bad person. The point that I'm making is the victim isn't out there. For most people, the victim is inside. 
that there are places where they feel victimized. I mean, I cannot tell you how many people feel like, well, you know, I'm never going to be able to manifest my spiritual life because there's no spiritual communities. There's no community support. I need a spiritual community. You know, and so part of you has just held the other part of you hostage by the fact that there's no spiritual community. So this is what I mean. These are, these are really common things that people say, but ultimately the archetypal energy going on there is the shadow of the warrior manifest as a victim because the authority to take action in the world and to do things is unclaimed. And the final um, shadow of the warrior that we work with is simply to choose to be invisible. And this is, this is really challenging for people to realize, but you know what? One of the main ways people deal with the fact that most of their life experience around power has been some kind of abuse or misuse of power. And so they just say, you know what? So I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to touch my own power. I am not going to abuse or misuse my power the way everybody else did to me in my life. So I am not going to touch it. Well, to not use the power you've been given is an abuse of power also. There's no opt-out clause here, people. We are beings of free will. There is no off switch, right? We are always taking action, and the actions we are taking are always creating reality, every single one of them. So to not pick up your power, to not do what you've come here to do, in and of itself is also an abuse of power. And so to be invisible, I don't mean the art of becoming invisible as an act of protection and then moving back out and being visible in your life. There's a lot of moments where I have chosen to become invisible for good reason. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people whose relationship with the power and taking action, taking powerful action in the world or warriorship, that their relationship with power is to become invisible, to ride on other people's coattails, to always support other people in their achievement of their goals without any consciousness of what your goals are. These are ways of being invisible. And this is also an abuse of power. So this is also the warrior in shadow. So all of this is not lost though. You know, because our leaders out there that are expressing all of these energies in shadow are ourselves, right? Our leaders out there are simply a reflection of the leader within ourselves. But the warriors out there are a reflection. That all, all that is out there that we would judge and become frustrated about is a reflection of what is within ourselves. So let us return to home, turn to inside of ourselves. And, and know that by learning to face our fears and accepting certain daily disciplines necessary to, you know, to follow those breadcrumbs of those fears and release our fear-based illusions, we can learn to discern accurately what is going on in life. That is the visionary piece of the warrior, discernment, by the way, discernment and, and finding, wielding that sword of truth. Discernment is the visionary uh, skill of the warrior. What is true in this moment? What is right action in this moment? What is actually even going on in this moment? And remember, if you are triggered by fear-based beliefs in the moment, you no longer know what is going on in the moment because you are now in the past. You are in that fear-based belief story that is telling you what's going on. You are not in the moment experiencing what's going on. And that's the warriorship, to stand naked of your past stories in the moment. There is, a, there is a nakedness and a vulnerability to true warriorship. And the image that I always think of in that is the hero in the movie who finds him or herself um, ambushed or caught unawares. The battle is now happening and they're just having noodle soup. They don't have any of their weapons with them. They were just having a cup of tea, right? And how the hero responds in the moment to whatever is present in the moment. There are no weapons. None of the things the warrior has been trained to use are present, but their plates and forks or teacups or coffee pots or whatever is there. 
And the warrior use, suddenly sees what is actually present in the moment. The training emerges through them and they prevail. Now, if we come upon that moment overlaid by old fear-based stories, we are not naked and vulnerable in the moment. We are safe in the perceived protection of the old stories and we can't see what the hell's going on. We have no true discernment and we will not prevail. We may recreate the same old patterns we did last time. We may survive, but we are not in reality. We are simply recreating what we've already done. So discernment is an incredibly important capacity to develop, the ability to discern. And with discernment, we've been able to determine what it will take to do what needs to be done and to do it or to ask for help doing it. And this is another aspect of warriorship is the recognition of when it is time to ask for help and ask. Again, the vulnerability of the warrior, that warriorship is in relationship with that vulnerability. It is not about not being vulnerable. It is about being in relationship with that vulnerability and, and, and dancing with it, moving with it, being with it and knowing how to respond because of it. So when we are willing to do whatever it takes, we engage in the transformation from enemy to ally. Now, there's one more distinction that I want to make here in this discussion. The mature warrior is willing to do whatever it takes. That's the point of today's show. Is willing to discern, is, is able to discern what right action is and is willing then to do whatever it takes, including asking for help. Okay. Now, the terrified child who is stuck in positions all the time learns to be willing to do it at all cost. And the cost for many children in these moments um, is soul loss or some sort of selling out or letting go or somehow some desperate act that allows survival but at a cost that is ultimately unacceptable. And that is the other dynamic of a true warrior is to do whatever it takes, but not at all cost. I saw a movie recently and frankly at the moment I cannot remember what it was. But what I found so fascinating about this journey this warrior was on in the movie is that they surrendered about four or five times in the process of this hour and a half long movie and and they they recognized the, that the cost was too great and they surrendered and then they found a way out and they continued on the journey blah 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 surrender found a way out continued on the journey and so this was a beautiful example and gosh I wish I could remember what the movie was but it was a beautiful example of that willingness to do whatever it takes and not being willing to do it at all cost and it is critically important that we, we draw those two things apart from each other because for most of us in our childhood, those two things are wrapped together. Doing whatever it takes and doing it all, at all costs are so enmeshed from our childhood experience that they are one thing. And it is important that we tease those two things apart. So if you are doing whatever you were doing at all costs, for example, your relationship with your aging parents or with your drug-addicted teen, then you are acting from the shadow of the child or the wounded child. And the path out of that is to explore the healing of your child and do whatever it takes there for the healing and transformation of that energy through your love. You, you, you do that act of warriorship first, then you can attend to the other then you can bring a willingness to do whatever it takes, but without all costs, to the other relationships. And again, if you try and you can't do that, that may be because there's soul loss that is locking you into an old pattern that keeps you from being able to access your power. Um, this was the theme of all my whole day of healing last week um, with every client, same theme. And so... Keep in mind that if you're listening to this and you're already frustrated because you've been trying to do this and it just hasn't been coming to fruition, 
then then accept the possibility that somewhere in the past you did it at all cost and lost yourself. And that until you get that part of yourself back and reintegrate him or her, you will be stuck in that pattern. And you will and you're not then or you're greatly handicapped then in really um accessing the warriorship that allows you to do whatever it takes. And for those of you that don't know, um, soul retrieval is an aspect of shamanic healing, number one, but number two, that many of us can do long distance. And so if you are interested in um, a long distance shamanic healing session with me, because you're listening to this radio show, who knows where, and you, you want to access that, don't be frustrated by distance or time. Just contact um, my office. That's assistance at lastmasscenter.org and schedule a session. I mean, assistance, A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E, assistance at lastmasscenter.org. Or just go to the website and contact us through the website, lastmasscenter.org. You can schedule a session. So the transformational art of the warrior is the transformation through love. Or how do you embrace the enemy in such a way that they become your ally? And so this whole conversation of warriorship keeps circling back around to the enemy within. You know, the spiritual warrior is intentionally wanting to transform the enemy within. And that circles us back around to this idea of the shadow. And the shadow, in its simplest sense, psychologically, is, are the aspects of ourself that are strongly disowned through strong fear or judgment. And so how would you know if you had stumbled into your own shadow, your own enemy within? The pattern is persistent. The pattern manifests in many variations on a theme. And often there is a fear or belief associated with it that you are treating as reality. And so the question that I leave you with here today is what are you willing to do? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to draw your resources out of the shadow? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to draw yourself out of the places and the ways that you've experienced soul loss in your life so that you can move out of the patterns the fear-based patterns that we, we um, hold on to because of our shadow issues and because of our soul loss issues. And just simply do whatever it takes to get yourself back. And with yourself back, these issues of facing your fears melt away. The issue of discernment becomes the art of the day, not a task you can never seem to get right. And with discernment, then your own ability to begin to to see what the day will take, to understand the warriorship of the moment, is is right there before you. That that ultimately, when we come into right relationship with ourself, these daily acts of warriorship are our second nature. We are trained daily, day in and day out to be codependent slaves to consumerism. That takes work to get someone there. It is your nature. It is your true nature to live as a warrior in the world and to master the art of transforming the enemies that you meet along the way, be they within or without, into allies. And with allies your gifts will be brought to the world. Thank you all for joining me here today. I hope you'll share the show with others if you've enjoyed it. I want to thank the ancestors for gathering around us and inspiring us here today. To thank the earth below for the beauty of the home that we all share, the sky above for breath and freedom from the suffocation of old ways. And I give thanks to the heart that unites us all. Next week, we have a very special guest, Annie Spencer, from the Hartwell Center for Shamanic and Ceremonial Ways. She is a presenter at the UK Society for Shamanic Practitioners Conference, often, many, many conferences, and is an elder in that community. And she will join us to talk about the very specific warriorship that is involved in rites of passage 
and her work with children and teens. Thank you all.